strange wills. Stories of strange wills made by strange people, starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Lorene Tuttle and Howard Culver with the original music of Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins, pride, envy, hate, jealousy, anger, despair, and greed. And here is Warren William. These are the stories of strange wills made by strange people. Men and women who defy and defile every moral law of respectability and decency to satisfy a mad desire, to right an imaginary wrong that burns like a raging fire in their shriveled souls. Strange wills are stories based upon actual wills gathered from courts all over the world. Names, places, and time have been changed so that no reflection can fall on any person or persons, living or dead. Only the sin remains. Deadly sins that cry out from the depths of the grave for vengeance. You'll presently see what I mean, but first, a word from your announcer. Now back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in The Mad Concerto. This is the story of a woman who voluntarily became a prisoner of love because of greed. It's not a nice story, quite the contrary. Mad Concerto is the story of a beautiful woman who gave up every feminine and human desire for the power that goes with dollars. Ten million of them. It happened a short while after I'd begun the practice of law in an eastern city on the Atlantic seaboard. I remember I was standing near the window of my office, looking out over the myriad of skyscrapers. Oh, how I craved excitement. How I prayed for one case to pull me away from the small, inconsequential work that is a young lawyer's lot. Perhaps I prayed too hard because... Mr. O'Connell speaking. Mr. O'Connell, you don't know me personally. But many years ago, I retained your father as my lawyer, and I have every reason to believe that I will find you just as sincere and trustworthy. Well, thank you, sir. Don't thank me. I haven't done anything for you yet. Yes, sir. Have you a pencil handy? Yes, sir. Mr... Then take this address down. 127 Kingsbury Road. Have you got it? Yes, sir, I have it. 127 Kingsbury Road. I want you here at 10 o'clock tonight. Come prepared to draw up a last will and testament. My last will and testament. I expect you to live up to every vow of privacy between client and lawyer. Oh, of course, sir. That goes without saying. Good. My matter is urgent and, well, let's say, unusual. My name, Mr. O'Connell, is Walker. J.C. Walker. Good day, sir. Had I heard correctly? Walker? J.C. Walker? No, it couldn't be true. Why, J.C. Walker was one of the richest financiers in America. Retired, he'd lived abroad and had recently come home. Why, my prayer was answered. I was excited. I tried to go back to the ordinary office routine, but the clock on the wall stood still. I'll never forget how long that day lasted. At exactly 7 o'clock, I got into my car and began the long 60-mile trip to the country estate of my client. I was tingling with anticipation. Uh, You you can't drive in there, mister. Private property. I'm looking for 127 Kingsbury Road, Mr. Walker's residence. Uh, What's the name? O'Connell. John Francis O'Connell, attorney at law. Oh, yes. Go right in. Mr. Walker is expecting you. Thank you. (laughs) 
I drove up the long driveway and stopped at the Walker Mansion entrance. Come in, please, Mr. O'Connell. Mr. Walker is waiting for you. He's in his study on the second floor. Thank you very much. As I entered the door, I stopped. It was like a beautiful dream come true. I mean her, of course. She was sitting at a concert grand piano, completely engrossed in her music. She was exquisite, something out of a picture book. She had a wild, barbarous look, and her blonde hair seemed to keep tempo with the strange, savage music she was playing. As I passed her, she glanced up for just a fleeting moment, and I saw she had brown eyes. Eyes that seemed to probe deeply into my soul. She held me with a long and tense look, and then I lowered my eyes and followed the servant up the stairs. Who was this strange creature, this most beautiful, most sensuous of women? Even the scent of her exotic perfume reached out like tentacles of doom and encircled me. Unfortunately, I was to learn later. Uh, glad you're here, O'Connell. Sit down over here by my desk and go to work. Thank you, sir. I feel very honored. Don't be. You may yet rue the day I called you. Drink? Yes, thank you. Uh, here's to a momentous night. And to your health, Mr. Walker. You gave me a hollow toast, Mr. O'Connell, because my doctor has given me just two weeks to settle my affairs and die. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm not unhappy about it. I've made millions, had everything. It's time to let someone else have a chance. Now, here are the bequests I've made. They're all down here on a slip of paper, all but one. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Mr. O'Connell, you saw Nadia playing the piano as you entered, didn't you? Oh, yes, sir, I did. I think she's very unusual, very lovely, very... Mr. O'Connell, you're out here to draw a will. Yes, sir. O'Connell... I love Nadia. I love her because she is a genius. I recognized her unusual talent from the first day I met her in Vienna almost nine years ago. I'd read that Nadia Winter was making her debut at the Wilhelmstrasse Theater, and I attended. Yes, and stayed to worship at the throne of genius. Never in my life had I seen such technique, such warmth and feeling. I remember as she was ending her final number. left the theater before she had taken her final bow and took the liberty of going backstage to make her acquaintance. Yes? My card, Miss Winter. I hope you'll pardon this intrusion, but as a sincere lover of music, I could not refrain I'm from... I'm very thankful for your interest, Mr... Mr. Walker. Won't you sit down, please? Yes, thank you. I won't detain you for more than a moment. Perhaps you'll be made happy with what I have to tell you. What? It's simply this... I'm old, retired, rich, and frank. And you might add, interesting too, Mr. Walker. Be that as it may. I want to tell you that your work tonight has impressed me tremendously. So much so that I want to help finance the completion of your musical studies here in Europe. And later I will arrange a series of concerts for you throughout the United States. Oh, Mr. Walker. Quite frankly, Miss Winter, I consider you a potential genius. And your talent belongs to all of us. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Walker. I am just a bit confused. All this, it's, it's so unexpected. Of course, I realize only too well that a professional career in music is long, tedious, and quite expensive as well. There need not be the slightest objection to my offer, Miss Winter. You may rest assured that your private life will remain your own. I will consider your offer in the same frankness in which you have given it, Mr. Walker. Please let me think it over for a day or two. I, I, I'm staying at the Terra House. Call me later in the week, and you've been very, very kind. As you can surmise, Nadia finally accepted my offer. I engaged the finest teachers for her, both here and abroad. Through the years, I think she grew to love me. Oh, not me personally, perhaps, but rather that innate sense of security that clings to wealth. Yes, Mr. O'Connell, this is a strange love that has borne strange fruit. I intend to perpetuate it. I want to die knowing that she will never love another man. 
that her every living breath will be devoted to her music and to my memory. Forgive me, Mr. Walker. I wish to withdraw from the case. Some other attorney... Nonsense, O'Connell. You're just infatuated with Nadja. All men are. It will pass. Nadja will see to that. Nadja has one weakness. She loves power. Needs it in order to successfully concentrate on her career. I honestly think she would sell her soul for power in order to accomplish her goal. This is my only chance to hold her. And I'm going to do just that, even though it's from my grave. The last bequest in my will, Mr. O'Connell, is one to you for ten million dollars. To me? Ten million dollars? Ten million dollars to be held in trust by you for the use and benefit of Nadia Winter. She is to receive the entire income for the rest of her life, so long as she lives here in this house, alone, and never marries. But, Mr. Walker, you can't be serious. On the contrary, I was never more serious. This girl has one of two choices, to live in luxury the rest of her life, enough to satisfy her every whim and aspiration, or to fall in love and lose her genius. What she will ultimately do rests in the lap of the gods and in the green-eyed monster of greed. <laughs> The will of James Carlson Walker was duly signed and executed three days later. And none too soon, for true to the doctor's prediction, J.C. Walker did not live beyond the following week. Nadja knew nothing of the trust. So I was instructed by the testator to advise her of the fact the day after the funeral. As I was admitted into the Walker residence, Nadja Winter was again at the piano, and her music more emotional, more savage than ever. She didn't hear me enter, and I stood quietly in the darkened shadows of the room. As the music swelled to a crescendo... Oh! I beg your pardon, Miss Winter. I am Mr. O'Connell, John Francis O'Connell, attorney at law. Mr. Walker asked me to come here and uh, discuss certain business matters with you. Oh, please sit down, Mr. O'Connell. And pardon me for not hearing you enter. I was lost in, shall we say, a musical thought. Thank you, Miss Winter. Please don't be so formal, Mr. O'Connell. Call me Narcha. Well, it would make me happy to. Mr. Walker told me just before he died that you would come to see me. Nadja, Mr. Walker has been exceedingly generous with you in a queer sort of way. I don't understand. He was always most kind and considerate. I don't know if his bequest to you was either kind or considerate. But he was determined that it should be final and absolute. He was always unusual, Mr. O'Connell. That is what made me love him. I never knew what to expect next. Nadja... I am trustee over a fund of a considerable amount of money, $10 million to be exact. You want to receive the entire income from this trust as long as you, well... Oh, come, John, it can't be as bad as that. As long as you live in this house, alone, and never marry. As long as I live here in this house, alone, and never marry? Yes, Nadja. But if you prefer to leave or marry, the money is to go to certain charities. I don't know what to say. Or do. He has made me a prisoner. A prisoner of love. And ten million dollars to form the bars of my cage. <laughs> but I want money. I want power more than anything the world or life can offer. And ten million dollars will get it for me. I'll stay, Mr. O'Connell. Yes, yes, I'll stay. And I'll get everything I want from life. Everything. You wait and see. Part two of Strange Wills follows in just a moment.
And now back to Mad Concerto and Warren William. For the first few months, I saw Nadja regularly. She seemed gay and carefree, and her music was light and restful. Then, quite suddenly, I noticed a change. The transition was abrupt. There was a distinct violence in her mood, as if a storm was brewing. I decided to have a serious talk with her for more than one reason. Oh, John, I don't know what I'd have done without you these last two years. But why must it be for only two years, Nadja? Because that's the way I've taught myself to live. Never to look beyond the horizon. And especially where you are concerned, Mr. Counselor. Nadja, I came over this afternoon to have a serious talk with you. Well, darling, haven't you always found me to be a good listener? Yes, that's the trouble. You listen very dutifully, and very beautifully, too. But somehow I never win my point before this lovely court of law. You simply won't conform to my pattern of reasoning, will you, John? No, because it's fallacious, Nadja. Now listen to me for a moment. For two years you've been working over eight hours a day on nothing but music. You've become a machine. Oh, why won't you... Give up my inheritance and marry you? You've said it a thousand times before, haven't you, John? Yes, I've said it a thousand times, but only because I love you, Nadra. I've loved you from the very first day I entered this house. I can't believe that your career is more important than a happy marriage, especially when you're forced to live alone. Alone like a prisoner in this house. I do it from preference only, John. You see... I don't think you understand my temperament. I am an artist. My whole life has been devoted to one principle, to forswear the world for music. Don't think I'm the first to do this. Oh, all the famous composers have sacrificed in one way or another their devotion to create. I am no different. I eat, sleep, and love, to be sure. But never for a moment do I forget why I am here. My music will one day be my monument. Your love for me, my affection for you, must remain secondary and without hope of fulfillment. But can't you see you've been changing, Nadja, and not for the better? Oh, John, don't you realize the hopelessness is... Oh, darling, you're young and beautiful. Your money's a curse that's not only permeated your body, but is affecting your soul. I beg you, let me turn it over to charity. Marry me now, Nadja, before it's too late. Keep your career. I'll do everything in my power to help you reach your goal. Oh, for the love I bear you, Nadja. Now, today, let's end this nightmare of horror. Stop! Stop! I'll not listen to another word. John, I have never really loved a human being. I have not the capabilities. I love only attributes in others. I love James Walker because he represents power, which to me is the greatest thing in life. And you too, John, I have love for your kindness and your understanding. Sometimes I wish that... But it's useless to discuss it further. You are a lawyer retained by my benefactor to carry out the provisions of a trust. I cannot, I will not ask for counsel or advice. My life is mine to do with as I choose. Hereafter, you will mail my check. And I ask you not to come back until I send for you. I see. I see I'm too late. Goodbye, Mr. O'Connell. Goodbye, Nadja. The savage way she turned to the piano horrified me. I left with a heavy heart. Yes, Nadja was losing her battle. Her power had been purchased at the price of freedom and sanity. I rode back to town, deeply depressed. I saw no more of Nadja for many years. Eighteen, to be exact. Her check was mailed regularly, and I'd heard rumors to the effect that she'd entirely withdrawn into herself and permitted no one to enter her home. Even tradesmen were required to leave their wares on the steps. Then, early one winter morning, it must have been round two o'clock. Huh? Oh. Hello? Mr. O'Connell. Mr. O'Connell. This is Nadja, Nadja Winter. Do you remember me? Oh, Nadja, you haven't once been out of my thoughts these many years. Come out right away, Mr. O'Connell. I have something of the utmost importance to discuss with you, and I want you to come alone. And please hurry. Please hurry, Mr. O'Connell. I'll be out there as fast as my car can get me there. (laughs) 
In 20 minutes, I'd left the city behind me and was making 60 over ice and snow that begged for caution. In memory, I was reliving the years. The last time I'd seen Nadja, she was young and breathtaking. But greed had been her bedfellow and power her counselor. I wanted to see Nadja again more than anything on earth. I left my car at the gate and trudged through the snow drifts to the house. As I approached the once beautiful and ornate mansion, I could hardly believe my eyes. The front porch had crumbled. Even the steps had rotted away, leaving gaping holes in the foundation. The windows were broken and the holes stuffed with paper. I climbed up and pushed against the door. It responded grudgingly to my touch. Nadja was at the piano, just where she'd been the last time I'd seen her. An old frayed dressing gown partially covered her gaunt, thin body. Her blonde hair, now streaked with silver, ran riot over her shoulders, looking like a thousand coiled serpents. Suddenly, she turned and looked up at me, and then I saw her eyes. Their soft brown luminousness had turned to stark, cold madness. She held me in her stare, much like a cobra holds its prey. Blood left my face. I was terrified by what I saw. Sit down, Mr. O'Connell. Things have changed a bit since you were here last, haven't they? Nadja, I'll call a doctor. You need help. <laughs> Medical and spiritual help. No, Mr. O'Connell, I don't need help. I sent for you for a very special reason. As you know, years ago, I gave up the world and its pleasures for money and for power. I wanted money because it gave me a chance to create. I wanted power because it would make the world listen to my music. All these years I've created, my music lies here in these boxes. It will live after me because you, you are going to publish it. Tonight, tonight I am giving my last concert. It is my greatest creation of all. I call it Concerto Finale. And you, Mr. O'Connell, shall be the first to hear it. First to hear it. <laughs> The music started out softly, tenderly. It sounded like the sparkling water of a murmuring brook as it danced lightly along on its way through forest and glen. I imagined it to be the early childhood life of Nadja, when youth was gay and filled with the laughter of crowded childhood. But in the next movement, I noticed a perceptible change. There were flashes of uncontrolled emotion breaking through to disrupt the calm tranquility of the theme. The tempo increased. The chords became discordant. It sounded like the cry of a distressed soul crying out for deliverance. Nadja was looking straight ahead, looking into the darkness and the gloomy shadows of the room. But I knew she was looking far beyond. She was reliving her life. And the poignant sorrows interspersed with happier moments had all been interwoven into this, the bitter end of her musical career. Now she'd entered into the final tragedy of her life. The wild notes shrieked into the room and blended with the moaning of the winter wind. I shuddered. Never had I heard music played like this before. To me, it seemed as if all the diabolical imps from Hades were striking the keys through her fingers. It was the discordant lamentation of the damned. I wiped the perspiration from my forehead in spite of the cold within the room. I must help Nadja and save her music at any cost. Quickly, I formulated a plan. While Nadja was lost in her mad reverie, I'd slip out and phone for medical assistance. I hoped she'd keep playing until I could return. I arose quietly and slipped out of the door and ran down the long, snow-covered path to my car. I could still hear Nadja's music as it swept along in its mad theme of abject misery and despair. Just as I was about to enter my car, I heard a dull rumble come from the direction of the house. I looked up. Great soaring fingers of flame were shooting heavenward. The house was on fire. 
Even as I hurried back, I knew I was too late. Like something out of Dante's Inferno, this house was becoming the funeral pyre of Nadja and her music. And through the crackling of the flames, I still heard the piano. Nadja was ending her mad concerto. Then, quite suddenly, the whole house collapsed like a tortured soul. And so ended the mad concerto. A girl genius, the lust for power, and the green-eyed monster of greed. But the sin did not die with Nadja Winter. It lives on in the hearts of men and women, secret and unconquered. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you what the official records say about the probate cause of the Mad Concerto. But first, a message from our sponsor. again is Warren William. And the fire? The records simply say fire of unknown origin. Was it accidental? Could it have been a human sacrifice at the pagan altar of greed? Who knows? For greed is the cause of endless suffering. What would have happened to Nadja Winter, I wonder, if she'd been able to live a normal, carefree life and still retain her genius? Perhaps the two are incompatible. I don't know. Do you? Next week, I'm going to tell you the story behind one of the strangest wills ever written. We're all familiar with the splendid results of modern psychiatry. But when you mix a mad, covetous psychiatrist together with a lovely, beautiful woman who has a husband, well, you've got a situation. We call this unusual story alias Dr. Svengali. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. written by Ken Crippen and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Telaways feature produced in Hollywood. <laughs>